um, there's probably like butter on me because I just watched the Eternals basically kill <laughs> you know, I was like, <laughs> all in the popcorn. What's up, fanatics? Welcome to Fanatic Now. I'm Brighton. And I'm Josh. And today we're going to be doing a review of the MCU's most recent film, Eternals. Eternals, the 26th movie in the MCU, is perhaps the most controversial yet. Based on the creations of comic juggernaut Jack the King Kirby, this is a movie that reconstructs the bylaws of the MCU. It's about 10 superpowered beings tasked with guiding humanity through the trials of early development all the way into modern times. They protected us from the evil deviants while allowing humanity the freedom to develop naturally. In the comics, cosmic sky daddies known as the Celestials created Eternals, Deviants, and Humans around a million years ago. However, in this movie, director Chloe Zhao sees the Eternals sent to Earth by the Celestials 7,000 years ago to protect humanity at the time of early civilization in the Fertile Crescent. From that point, we get to learn each team member's unique gifts, character traits, and where they are in the current timeline as the Deviants pop up their ugly mugs again. Josh and I were able to see the movie on opening day, spoiler free, and immediately recorded our quick reactions. That's been a few days now, so we've had about enough time to get our first thoughts and come together to discuss here with you today. We're going to show you those initial reactions and then come back to do more of a deep dive into the movie. But before we go any further, this is your final spoiler warning. At Fanatic Now, we don't like to spoil shit. We want you to appreciate the movie and make your own first opinions. So if you haven't seen it yet, what the hell are you waiting for? Pause this, go see the movie, come back to the video afterwards. All right, let's roll the clips. All right, so just finished watching Eternals. For the first time, the opening day. Wow, what a phenomenal film. I really loved it. Good diversity in it. I felt like they covered a lot in it. There's a lot of conversations going on. So they kind of explained a lot of what the Eternals were and in really good detail. The twist, the turns, the whole 65% um, of the, I feel like 65% of the predictions we had had were answered the whole celestial seed and the planet thing the whole point of the Eternals being like androids which is awesome and then near the end the post credit scene with Eros and Pip and then him being Thanos's brother phenomenal awesome the mention of the Eb Ebony Blade so which means Black Knight and obviously with that final post credit scene we get the Black Knight and at least a, a disembodied voice that I'm not 100% sure what the whose voice it was. So definitely I'm um, gonna try to find a file of that and re-listen to it and see if I can figure out who that is. But yeah, overall, it was a very, very good film and I feel like the critics are giving a little bit harder of a time than it deserves. I really, really don't know what else to say. So I just finished watching The Eternals and don't believe the critics. That was really good. It was really good. Um, it got convoluted a little bit in the third act, but the first two acts were really good. Beautiful, good score, good music, sound effects. Um, the team felt good. I felt like Kingo kept you laughing. Uh, Sprite was the soul. Cersei was the heart. Um, to fit a 10 person team and some side characters in, in that amount of time and be pretty damn successful at it. Um, you really get to know the team. In the third act, the pacing does feel off. Um, so I understand some of that critique, but overall, no, I really liked it. It felt like a James Cameron movie. And when I say that, I mean the good and the bad. It was absolutely beautiful. The storytelling was amazing, but sometimes he gets so into the story and the dialogue that the pacing doesn't feel like what you expect out of a movie. But that's not necessarily necessarily a bad thing. This felt more like a book at most times than a movie because it it was dense. But I love that and I think the Marvel needs more of it. So I'm going to sit on this for a few days and we'll get together with Brighton and 
yeah. I don't think I'm gonna change my mind much on this, but we'll see. All right, so you can see I was a little all over the place, but because I really loved the movie and couldn't find the right words that quickly. So well, what did you think, Josh? I really, really liked it too. And we haven't had a much chance to talk about this much, but I don't think the critics know what they're talking about for the most part. Yes, the movie does get a little convoluted with pacing in the third act. That much is true. But the first two acts were so beautifully directed. The graphics were amazing for 99% of the movie. The golden aura that envelops the Eternals, uniquely based on their abilities, was like something we've never seen before. The soundtrack and score were equally beautiful. Songs like Pink Floyd's Time and Skeeter Davis's End of the World were perfect choices for the scenes. And we even got to hear some Merle Haggard in there with Gilgamesh. Speaking of Gilgamesh, the sound effects, every time he knocked the shit out of somebody, was incredible. I don't think I've ever felt a punch like that in a theater before. I honestly could go on and on about the things that I loved. But I want to defend and critique a few of the negatives. So before I do that, I want to say I think Rotten Tomatoes is probably the worst creation in film rating history. Most of these people are not real film critics with any cinematic education or even journalistic training. And at times, I doubt they've even seen the movie that they're scoring. But I do understand why some people would leave the theater saying, what? And I have two main reasons. First, the pacing. This is unlike any MCU film and honestly different from any movie I've ever seen. It feels like you're reading a book, but it still gives you the tropes of a comic flick. Now, I personally love this. I want more dialogue heavy movies for the comic genre. But in the third act, the pacing starts to rush and it does change a bit. I know by most standards, this is considered a long movie. Is it what, two hours and 37 minutes or something yeah. like that? It's a long movie. But I actually think that the third act needs another 15 or 20 minutes to not feel awkward. It didn't ruin the movie for me. Because even though it gets convoluted, it never felt confusing. But a critique is a critique and it did feel different. But when you try to pack in 10 characters full of unique qualities, you do take shortcuts. You have to. That's why books are nearly always better than their movie counterpart. Storytelling takes time, and this was a massive story. The second reason I think that people might not would have liked this movie, and this is not a dig at them, I'm, I'm not trying to put anybody down, but I think her directing choices actually went over some people's heads. She brought a nuance to the genre that we haven't seen before. It's a superhero movie that isn't a superhero movie. The villains aren't exactly villains, the superheroes aren't exactly superheroes. If this story had been told straightforward, it would have been just as confusing as the original comic run that Jack Kirby did. I love Jack Kirby, but the comic run did not get great reviews. Yeah. A lot I, of I don't comic even think it got good reviews until like it's a revival later on in like yeah, the yeah, yeah. 80s Pe and 90s. People in the hindsight talk about how great The Eternals were by Jack Kirby, but most people couldn't read it. Yeah. It, got, it was convoluted mm -hmm. and confusing. Yeah. She took the confusion out of it. Now, if it had been directed like other MCU properties, it would have been cheesy. Chloe Zhao did something different. She made a beautiful piece that accomplished most of the comic tropes that we love while full on making fun of those other tropes. And it wasn't just her blending MCU ways into this movie. She went out of her way to capture the magnificent of folklore itself, from the Epic of Gilgamesh to the Emerald Tablet. Greek, Roman, and Norse gods, heroes and adventures, to religious stories like Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and Hinduism. The, the only hiccup to me that hurt the film was not giving the main villain Crow enough time in his fully evolved form. Like, he was a cool character there at the end, but by the time we got him, yeah. we didn't have a whole lot of yeah, him. He, wasn't he much served to, a quick yeah. purpose and was gone. The other one is, we had a few easily predicted moments with Icarus. We both said the same thing. When yeah. we came together to talk about it, we were like, we saw pretty early yeah. on the Icarus was the I would say, Icarus was the very first person to be, be like, oh, Ajax was killed by a deviant. Yeah. And even though you could we, tell. we'd seen a deviant already, but there, there was really no hint or idea that that would have been a possibility. Yeah. It was a little rushed in its idea. And Icarus was well acted, but the story, you could you could kind of feel what was going on a little bit. Not the specifics, but you knew that yeah. something was going on. And other than that, the rush pacing at the end. That, that is a complaint. Um, 
Now, my favorite aspects are what I mentioned when I walked out of the theater. These synthetic beings gave an in-depth look at humanity through a unique spotlight of eternity. Sprite and Kingo are the equal yet opposite ends of the spectrum. Sprite yearns for the human condition but lives thousands of years without being able to embrace it, while Kingo takes full advantage of his life, embracing all of the fruits of humankind. In the middle, we have Cersei, embracing both of those feelings and being the most relatable. But I know you have a lot to say about the human aspect with this movie. That's one of the main things that really got to you, right? Yeah. So, all right, so what are your thoughts with this? Overall, I believe it was phenomenal. Now, I do I do agree, at the end of Act 3, it at the end with Act 3, it felt a little bit on the cramped side. Like, they were trying to rush it and should have let it have been a little bit more um, organic. And that could be because they felt they couldn't release a three-hour I agree. And so, that that's an understandable thing. Hell, they didn't they want to do it with Infinity War or Endgame, yep. so why would they want this movie to also be able to push that boundary? So, that could have possibly been why it felt more, like, cramped, pushed together, cramped together. But, on the human aspect, they, they attempted to make these beings that have been around for all of human existence and longer and feel relatable they gave them relationships struggles interests, etc they really immersed each character in their kind of their own human convictions yeah. you have festus who really was pushing for humanity to advance was giving them new technology was trying to see that that creation of the human of humanity grow and then with the introduction of the H bomb and his inventions, be inventions becoming this, this end end all be all, he gave up on humanity, and that's honestly where a lot of people kind of feel after those big tragedies like that. Some yeah. people just feel like they're giving up on humanity. Um, he kind of had that whole open Oppenheimer mm -hmm. thing, which I think Oppenheimer didn't even actually ever say anything about regretting it, but. There's this whole folklore about how much he regretted it. I don't know if it's even true, but it really does feel like with Fastos that they were kind of playing on that. Yeah, kind of a reflection of Oppenheimer. Sprite. They give, like, jealousy is a emotion everybody feels, and regularly for a lot of people. And she's kind of an embodiment of it over time. Like, And obviously she she's in love with Icarus, but... Part of me wonders if it's even more of her being in love with Icarus versus her kind of love in love with the idea or infatuated with the idea of being able to have an adult relationship. It may not even entirely be the person as much as it is the opportunities. Did, did you notice when they um, when Icarus and Cersei got married, the um, it shows the other eight of them and they're all like, oh, they're so happy. And right in front, Sprite's like, yeah. Yeah, so she was obviously not. She yeah. was from the very beginning, but before Kingo even kind of tells you that, like before he basically turns to the audience is like, "Hey guys, Sprite's in love with Icarus." You can they were starting to drop those hints, and yeah. I still, um, I think that obviously she was in love with him, but it may have just been more of the romanticized idea of being able to grow up and be in those different adult relationships and not basically walking around like a 15 year old. Yep. No, I, I completely agree. And then you have Cersei with her, her whole ideal around romance. Cause obviously she's very much in love with Icarus and it's not, not just the love of like more, not like a romantic love between two people, but also the love for humanity. You see that especially earlier on when they're in, um, Babylon, Cersei's outside the walls in the farms with the people. Yep. So not only was she embodying kind of the romance between you and another person, but also kind of the love for humanity. She was the heart of this movie. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, finally, I just wanted to touch on Druig, who kind of went the cult leader-ish route. Like, but it was more of like human salvation. Like. I say cult leader, but it could be more, you can construe it as Christianity or most religions as far as trying to find peaceful ways to resolve human conflict. Right. May not always end up that way. As we see, Druig has 
guns all over the farm, apparently. So he obviously was prepared for something. But I feel like you can. They really tried to hammer home how each person has their own abilities and has kind of a human characteristic as well that most people could try to find something they identify with. I won't rant on about the other characters as well because I feel like these were more of the where we see it the strongest. Yeah, but I mean, you get 10 characters and 10 different results from living that same kind of life. Mm -hmm. That embraces that human connection that mm -hmm. you're talking about. You get to see it play out in 10 different ways. And that's a lot to cram into yeah. a movie. Yeah. I know I talked bad about the pacing and you noticed it too in the third act, but they put a lot in this movie. Yeah. But to say all that about how human they're made out to be, by the end, when they're kind of battling it out, you kind of are pulled out of that humanity again. And they're these grand heroes with their superpowers. And it feels a little bit more of a Marvel film at the end, which isn't, isn't bad. But as far as it not feeling like a superhero film majority of the way through... And then at the very end, dumping all of the superhero shit right there, it kind of pulls you out a bit. Yeah, it's almost like some of the tropes that she had so beautifully played around with. At the end, she had a quota where I have to get this much action, this amount of that villain play. Like, we got to force some things in here, but I also have all this story to finish up. Mm -hmm. It just got a little convoluted. Yeah. Overall, I found it to be an incredible film that didn't really deserve those low ratings that we're seeing yeah. on things like Rotten Tomatoes or, I mean, even on IMBD, it is a bit of a low score for what I personally would have given it. Yeah. But I also gave Venom, Let There Be Carnage a higher score. So, you know, I mean, maybe maybe my, my ratings are a little bit off in some ways. Everybody's different. Everybody's allowed to rate things however they want. It's just, when you see IMDb being in the mid to high six point whatever, you're like, okay, I, I can get where people are with that. But when people are just rating this like a 10 or 15 or 30, 40, yeah. I, what did you watch? Let's go ahead and um, score this movie real quick. You want to okay. go ahead and score it? Sure. Um, all right. So I have went back and forth with how I want to score it. But let's bring out the comic book grading scale. As you know, I love comics. So, And even in the background, you can see a lot of my graded comics um, where they're slabbed. And we're going to use the same grading scale that they use for grading those comics to grade movies. You want to do that? Yeah, yeah. All right. And if you're confused what the grading scale is for, like, the comic book grading scale, um, go check out our Instagram. Uh, it's going to be on there, so you can definitely kind of follow along as far as what each score is going to be meaning. You want to go first? Sure. All right. So I have nonstop went back back and forth between a 7.5 and an 8. I honestly struggled to decide which one or the other. Everything about the first two thirds of the movie makes me want to give this a 9. But the, those convoluted moments, the, the lack of the villain feeling natural there, and him being great for a little bit but not getting a lot of that, um, the predictability of a few things, I decided to drop it to a 7.5, but it's a strong 7.5. It's a 7.5 that I could easily be talked into going with an 8. And I haven't seen it a second time, and I could change my mind about giving it an 8, but as of today, I'm going to say a 7.5. What All about right. you? I'm going to give it a little bit higher. I kind of landed on an 8.5. Mm -hmm. Like, there were those problems, like the, the pacing towards the end, and... You, you're right, Crow wasn't really developed more as a villain, and that kind of pulls some stuff out. And then, like I, like I was talking about, how I, they kind of switch up how I felt like thematically the movie was going, where it was more yeah. of a more of a down to earth, making these immortal beings seem human, packing in that extra superhero feel at the end. It it kind of drops it down a bit, so. Um, I'm pretty strong, solid in my 8.5. I could, I, I could probably it. bounce down to 8 point if I saw it again and found a couple more things. But for right now, no, solid 8.5. I respect an 8.5 all day. Um, like I say, I, I was really close to an 8. But 
you want to average it out and say 8.5, 7.5, and make our Fanatic Now score an official 8.0. Yep. All right. So Fanatic Now's review of this is going to be an 8.0. Nice. All right. Now, now that we've got the review done, let's get into some questions. So first up, we talked about some of the critiques floating around on the interwebs, and there's been plenty. But there's one you touched on about some reasons why people may not have liked it. And I think I know where you may be going with that. So my first question for you uh, is, was Eternals too woke? All right. So yeah, that, that does seem to be a, you were a, hitting real, that earlier, a right? real current problem is that it's, it's too woke. And that's part of the reason why we have um, multiple like bad scores for it. And for all the people that say it's too woke, you need to open your mind a bit. Yeah. Because nothing about this movie felt forced in its wokeness. That's exactly what I was thinking. Nothing felt forced. Like, like you could the first homosexual relationship in a Marvel film. It was first just pub, public one, I guess I should yeah. say. But it was just there. It was nothing... It was what you'd walk in if you saw inside a straight family's home, you saw inside a gay family's home. Yep. Why does that why does that matter? If anything, you should be more uncomfortable with the quote unquote sex scene that happens a little bit earlier. Yeah, I mean, if you're gonna show a straight relationship sex scene and you have a gay relationship that is just that wholesome family environment and there's not they're not flaunting anything about homosexuality it's just it's there and even so, if they did why does it matter right whoever has sex with whoever let it be the, the the thing that bothered me the most about the sex scene was the fact that if i'm cersei and i can change the matter and atoms of of you know, qualities of different type of things. If I'm laying on a hard rock, I'm going to change it into a mattress. Yeah, or, I don't know if she could do it like that exact, but maybe like some feathers at least, you yeah. know, like some comfortable like dow feathers. The only thing know? worse than a rock is probably sand. Sex on the beach. <laughs> what are y'all thinking? That's uh, you don't want any cake by the ocean? <laughs> Slapping cheeks and they just fill up with sand. <laughs> um, well... Aside from all of that, I guess we'll move on to the next thing about, like, the first deaf character in a Marvel film. Again, it was, honestly, more, made more sense for a character than yes. anything, because she was a speedster. At that point, it wouldn't, it wouldn't matter if you had eardrums, because you would have blown them out at the speed you were moving. Yep. Like, if this isn't DC, where you have, like, the speed force to kind of help cut down on the possibility of that and allow atoms to move around your body. Or Quicksilver, a mutant whose body has evolved for this. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it kind of makes sense that there would be a deaf character, and no part of having to read the subtitles brought anything away from the movie. Honestly, she might have been one of my favorite characters out of it, because her laissez-faire attitude about everything going on was... Kind of how I felt like if I could lock myself away for 3,000 years and just yeah. read, I probably would. <laughs> like in real life, I hate thieves. I hate a thief. But in that movie, <laughs> I'm pulling for her the whole time. Like, yeah, get, get the Emerald Tablet. Get it. <laughs> she, it, it, that scene is going to be way too much to go into here, but there are so many Easter eggs full in that room when they find her and she's yeah, yeah, like yeah. all lackadaisically reading and everything. That was uh, that was awesome, and I know it has nothing to do with um, the woke part of it. But since we're talking about her, mm -hmm. the way they filmed her speed scenes, I loved it. They didn't mm -hmm. copy the Flash. They didn't copy Quicksilver. They did something new, and man, I thought it was beautiful. I feel like the final thing is the representation of POCs, like people of color. But there, there was m multiple races represented in this movie, so. Did you see any point where you thought that was forced? Like No. And again, the only reason why anybody would think it would be forced is because they're just used to the fact that their characters should be straight white people. You should you should allow your mind to be open to the fact that anybody of any color can really play a role. Yeah, especially when you're trying to if if you're a celestial and you're trying to develop 10 beings that can spread around the earth 7,000 years ago, you need to have every type of race covered and 
to white. me it was just common sense like this movie would not have made any sense if they were all white yeah it wouldn't have made sense no none at all and also if you look at it from a cel the celest the celestial's point of view when he made him why would you care what color <laughs> someone's was skin was yeah he was red. the fuck was red <laughs> like he is all good but yeah. like he didn't make any red characters yeah all that aside regardless if you thought it was too woke you need to check yourself a little bit and just check maybe yourself before you wreck yourself check yourself before you wreck yourself you heard it here first folks and probably many other places <laughs> but um i know you love easter eggs mm. so what were some of your favorite easter eggs that you found in the eternals oh there were so many delicious little eggs they were everywhere not only Easter eggs to other MCU properties, but to science and history. And you know I love that. So, like, um, let's start with the, the new Marvel title card. They've added Shang-Chi into it. Mm -hmm. um, I think he was in the M? Yes. And, and then when you got the f um, the flipping page effect or whatever, you see a lot of the Jack Kirby drawings of Celestials. So they got a mm -hmm. little bit of that in there. So after the title cards... Um, not exactly an Easter egg, but I think worth pointing out the first use of an opening crawl. Now, me growing up in the 80s and 90s, I saw opening crawls in a lot of movies. It was commonplace, um, most famously Star Wars, obviously. But the MCU has never done an opening crawl before. And not only did we get an opening crawl, it was like beautifully written. It was like epically written mm, and yeah. all a lie. It was all Ersham's lies. Yeah. It, it, it was, yeah, straight propaganda. Mm -hmm. it, that wasn't anything. Well, I mean, I guess there are some truths in it, but it was a big lie. It, but but it was cool to see an opening crawl in an MCU movie. Um, let's see, Easter eggs. Uh, when Cersei walks past Charles Brown's statue, she calls him Charlie. Mm -hmm. Now, I may be reading into this, and it could be easy to miss, but I'm assuming that's because she actually knew him personally and possibly influenced his scientific theories. You think so? Ah, old Charlie. Old Charlie. She's been around 7,000 years. She went everywhere that was like influential and... Yeah. I don't know, man. I'm going to stick with it. Because... I And she would have... Because it's kind of made out to be that she went to... She went to England and kind of stayed in England. Mm -hmm. Like... It, yep. With the only person that we don't know if where they've come from is Sprite. Like, we see Sprite in England, but she came from somewhere else. Right. Everybody else is kind of presumed to have just been, just yeah, stayed where been they've been for, time. like, yeah. the last 2,000 years mm -hmm. since they split up. I think she knew old Charlie boy. Um, and then she gives that lesson about apex predators in the classroom when, mm -hmm. uh, when the earthquake was happening or whatever. Um, as soon as we get a lesson about how the Celestials are now the apex predator of the MCU, it's like... I felt a correlation there. She's talking, she's teaching everybody what an apex predator is. And then we basically meet and learn about the Celestials being the new apex predator. We've mm -hmm. thought of Thanos as the apex predator. He's taken care of. It's kind of introduced the Celestials as the new apex predator. I feel like that was a correlation there on purpose. Um, Chloe Chow's a very smart storyteller in how she does mm -hmm. things. I feel like she, she did that. Um, the references, the references to Excalibur. Uh, that made me think about Merlin because he did exist in the Marvel comics and it makes me think about how he was probably most definitely a Sorcerer Supreme. Oh. Yeah. I don't know. Was he a Sorcerer Supreme in the comics at all? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but he is in my book. Um, I hope we get that flashback whenever we get the Black Knight history because... I, I don't think that we're going to get this huge backstory where we have like an entire movie of like the older Black Knights. Yeah. But we'll get scenes because mm -hmm. there's been multiple. Yeah. And I really hope we get some of that backstory and I hope we get some Merlin. I know it won't be a big character, but I hope we get an, an You don't important... think they would make Merlin a big character? Like I guess or unless like he's only, if he's only in backflash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like he'll, he'll play a big role in small chunks of the movie. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, and this is one that I unfortunately heard about when the trailer released, but it was so cool to see Icarus meet Dane Whitman because in Game of Thrones, Rob Stark says to Jon Snow, next time I see you, you'll be in all black. To which Jon replies, it was always my color. Well, you Thronies out there will remember that 
they never saw each other again because Game of Thrones is a straight bloodbath. I want to know because I have yet to finish it. Uh. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh, Red Wedding. Um, but here they are reunited and Icarus is the one in all black. But we know that Dane Whitman will become the Black Knight because black was always his color. I really like that part. Maybe I'm reading into it, but a lot of other people did too, because that one wasn't one I noticed. Mm -hmm. Other people noticed that Easter egg. Um, so, not taking credit for that one, but it was cool. Um, I love Houdini history, and there was a cool poster hinting that Sprite inspired the illusionist. Now, it doesn't say that, but it has that whole whisper effect, mm -hmm. so it's kind of given the effect. And, um, and that's kind of a call, because she appears like that as Tinker. It, she looks very Tinkerbell-esque, yeah. which is kind of cool because she's later called Tinkerbell by Kingo. Yeah, 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 yep. And there were so many cool references with different historical sites. My favorite being the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. That was beautiful. But I particularly loved one that I think was easy to miss. You know I love Sumerian history because mm -hmm. of early civilization. We've had a lot of talks yeah, about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of talks. Ancient astronaut theories, which this kind of is. Yeah. So it plays really well with this. But I love Sumerian history. And well, remember when Cersei handed the knife to the child at the beginning of the movie? She, Cersei changed a primitive makeshift blade into a beautiful blue and gold dagger. You were given the visual of the hand of Cersei on the right, the child on the left, invoking Michelangelo's The Creation of Adam. This is so cool because most people consider Sumer the birthplace of civilization. And that's a slightly, slightly different, but way too similar to be a coincidence version of an actual dagger found in the royal tombs of Ur. It's currently in the Baghdad Museum. To me, including that at a point of first contact, that's the Easter egg of Easter eggs. I mean, that was a real blade that's in a museum mm -hmm. that we know about. That's like one of the earliest blades ever found. And we get to see that being passed on, created by Cersei and yeah. passed on to humanity. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was a beautiful scene. Um, and speaking of first contact, there are Star Trek prime directive tropes all over this movie with Ajax. And I don't know if you caught this, but I see Captain Picard everywhere I look. And them eggs were delicious. But um, I got a question for you. So do you think this goes with, you know, Thanos and everything else, but we, we've we got to start wondering now, were the Celestials right? Because you see Kingo agree. Like, mm -hmm. you get the argument amongst the team. Pretty much half the team agrees that yeah. the Celestials should do it one way and the other half don't. And... Is the cost of seven billion people worth hundreds of billions? Like it's the age old question of is the is one life worth is the cost of one life worth two lives? And Cap would always say that we don't trade lives. Yeah. But these weren't lives that had created yet. Like it it was giving birth, birth. so that civilizations could form in millions and billions of years and everything. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's a deep question yeah. there. And it, it is like a, it is very reminiscent of what we've gotten with Thanos in the past mm -hmm. of, well, I'm doing this just for the greater good. There's no, and it's kind of funny that Thanos wiped out half the population to save the planet. And it technically was saving the planet because if he literally. had it, the celestial would have emerged. Yep. So. Ajax literally says that, that yeah. he delayed it and he would have delayed it by quite a bit because yeah. he took out assumingly what 3.6 billion people or so on earth so yeah and this as we happened. saw with what happened during falcon and the winter soldier it's kind of chaotic then so for civilization to eventually re-put itself together and that would have been probably another few hundred years before it had reached that number yeah. possibly uh, but this all makes me really think of galactus uh -huh. who we could possibly be seeing here in the future. Yep. Um, one, we know we're getting a Fantastic Four film. Mm -hmm. And two... We know nothing about it yet, but we know we're getting it. Exactly. And two, Galactus is obviously one of their biggest biggest villains <laughs> in both stature and in just comic relevance. But Galactus... One of the creations of Silver Surfer was Silver Surfer asked Galactus before he was Silver Surfer why are you destroying our planets? And Galactus said, I need to eat to survive. 
I require a planet that has had intelligent life on it to survive. He's not you, evil villain. He yeah, just has to eat. He has to eat. And he says to Silver Surfer, I am doing what I need to survive. You are no more to me than ants are to you. And it uh, that really brings up that question of why would Earth have mattered so much? The Celestial being born out of the Earth is no more than us stepping on an ant. Like, the Celestial is just trying to be born, and that's what it requires to be born. So do you think that he only... Galactus will only be going to planets that have an egg? I don't know. I don't imagine it'd be the only planets that have an egg. Because you know, in the comics, he needs the the people but it's not literally eating the people it's the energy and everything he that, needs like, that's why i said he needs he needs a he needs a planet that um a planet that's had intelligent life on it but in the comic silver surface says well i'll go warn people so they can leave the planet and you can eat the planet right. afterwards exactly so if he's not needing to eat the people and we but what I'm asking is how it translates from the comics to the movies. Do you think that they'll do the whole thing where instead of just the power of where civilizations like um, power plants and, you know. You think he needs to specifically eat celestial egg? seeds? I don't know. Possibly. You know, you know how they like to both simplify things to make it easier to understand, but make it directly correlate with the other movies? Yeah. So that would make me wonder if they might do something like that. All right. So... I want to get more into Galactus. I got a lot of theories of my own, but we are getting into that theory territory now. So, why don't we wrap this video up by talking about the mid and post credit scenes. And if you're liking this, make sure you're liking the video. Um, Subscribing, yeah, comment, subscribe. sharing. We want you to come back because we're going to probably do another Eternals video, but this time it's going to be less about the movie directly and more about maybe things we wanted to see in it and things we want it to mean for the MCU later on kind and our some own personal educated theories. educated guesses, yeah. some predictions. Because we don't really have leaks of hardly any of this stuff yet, mm -hmm. so it'll just be predictions, but educated guesses. So, what did you think of the mid and post credit scenes? The mid credit scene was pretty... Pretty spontaneously incredible. I was not expecting to be kind of that caught off guard because earlier we had talked about Thanos being um, Thanos being an Eternal. We weren't sure if they were going to do it in the MCU, and to hit us with arrows. Yeah. Harry Styles, first of all, which this may be his first acting debut as an actual character and not a like cameo. Right. Right. I'm not sure, but um, somebody told me that that this was like his first like real acting debut. It looks like. Everybody seems to like Harry Styles so much, and you couldn't give him a better character than basically a character whose superpower is they make you like him. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody has to fall in love with Eros, the Star Fox. So, I mean, I feel like it's well casted. Yeah. I didn't see it coming. I wouldn't have predicted it. No. If, um, I, if I was casting for this movie, I, I would have been... I would not have picked Harry Styles first, but I really do love it. It's the perfect choice. And the way they introduced him uh, with Pip... I thought it was funny. Patton Oswalt was the perfect pick for, for Pitt. But I gotta admit, the CGI looked a little off on Pip to me. Yeah. In a in a movie that had phenomenal yeah. CGI. This was a beautifully CGI'd film. Pip looked 10 or 15 year old dated type of technology. He just didn't seem right. I don't know. And I, and I, I I've been trying to like I've been trying to figure out what this could be, what this could mean. Cause like originally my my response to it was maybe they were trying to make him look that cartoony ish weird because Pip is like a weird character in in the comics, but that also doesn't entirely make sense because why would they have gone that route? Like yeah, I I don't know. Yeah, because it's not the character design. I thought the character design was good. It was literally like the the special effects of making him look like he was in that room with the actual humans or Eternals, but you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He didn't look like he was in the room with the actors. When yeah. Thanos was around all these other people, you knew that yes, he's CGI, but he didn't feel like he felt like mm -hmm. he was there. Pip just felt a little awkward, but what the scene means and what you were going with, with Eros and Star Fox, I'm excited about all that. We need to find out more about his connection with Thanos. Yeah. And then, um, and then that final, that final post-credit scene with um, 
with Black Knight now, you noticed a little bit more about this than I did because you you kind of shocked me with some information. So well, I had to double check it. So when when you first hear the whisper, the voice, my mind instantly went to Merlin. But that's because I was excited the entire movie because <laughs> I was hoping for to get that Black Knight backstory. I'm hoping Merlin's a part of that. So I was almost waiting for it and wishing and. And as soon as I heard the whisper, I was like, was that Merlin? Was that Merlin? But I recognized the voice. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure, but I, you know, I've watched what, Luke Cage and um, True Detective. And Ali is such a good actor. That I knew his voice, but it, it took me a minute. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it as it was happening. I had to think about it. And about probably five to 10 minutes later, I remembered he's um, Blade. I'm trying to think of all the characters in my head. Mm -hmm. And once I got to Blade, I'm like, that was his voice. So it wasn't an instant me figuring it out, but I was pretty sure once I thought about all the characters that could relate to Black Knight, and when I got to Blade, I was like, yeah, I think so. And then I double checked it, and apparently it had already been announced by um, makers <laughs> of the movie. But luckily I hadn't, I, I got into this movie very spoiler free, and I'm very happy about yeah. that. It doesn't happen much these days. No, not at all, but. Uh, I'm very excited to, I think, I'd, I'm just genuinely excited to see what we're going to get with Black Knight. And, and I think... The, the Ebony Blade. The Ebony Blade. I think they cast him very well. There. Yes. Very fluidic when he mm -hmm. moved around. Which could be in reference to a more, uh, another fluidy black creature that may have just made its debut into the MCU. So... We we will see, and you know maybe we'll have all these theories for you in another video. Yeah. Later later next this month probably. I want to talk about Gore the God Butcher. Got, I want to talk about No. Got to talk about Namor. The connection with Blade, uh, Midnight Suns. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot that we want to talk about here. And then like I say with theories, yeah, I've got some theories about Galactus as well, and Namor, and the Fantastic Four in general. Mm -hmm. I got a good one about the Fantastic Four, so we definitely want to get to that. So yeah, um, thanks everybody for watching. Um, we really hope you enjoyed the video. We're gonna try to do reviews of every every kind of fanatic movie that comes out. So definitely, you know, keep informed. Hit that subscribe button. Ring that bell. Hit the like button. Anything you want to add? Later, fanatics. Later, fanatics.